Trump administration, also the Biden administration, though, uh, a real lack of coordination, yeah. right? I mean, so. 아, 안녕하세요. 매일매일 운동하기를 실천해야 하는 동탄 왕코입니다. 아, 아, 오늘부터 영어 학원을 갈 거예요. 아, 저 지금 오늘 원래 오후 2시 출근이지만 8시에 일어났습니다. 오늘부터 하루를 다시 시작을 해보겠습니다. 후. 아, 영상은 오랜만에 찍지만 계속 운동을 했습니다. 어제는 달리기 러닝을 잠깐 뛰었고 팔굽혀펴기도 했고요. 아, 오늘은 스트레칭이랑 팔굽혀펴기 위주로 하도록 하겠습니다. 역시 운동할 때 CNN이죠. For her and the Trump administration's role during the pandemic, here's the clip. Oh. I think the way we handled COVID was oh, tragic. I think that the president's oh. uh, vanity oh. got in the way. I he was he was working for his base. He was not working for his country. <gasps> I was part of that, and I don't think I'll ever forgive myself um, oh. with respect to COVID. I don't think I can ever oh. redeem myself. What's your response to that? I mean, obviously, she played along, she hated, she abetted, she amplified, uh, but she's saying this now um, that she'll never forgive herself. How do you take that? Well, tell that to the 700,000 Americans who are dead. I have no respect for former administration uh, uh, top rank officials who remained silent while the president told the country that this was no big deal, that it was just a flu, <sighs> that it was the Kung flu, uh, when the president refused to wear a mask when the president uh, encouraged states to open up before they were ready, when the president uh, said we were doing too many tests, when the president endorsed hydroxychloroquine, now, you know, they were silent then. I don't want to hear from them now. I have no respect for these people. It would have mattered back then if they spoke up. Right. Dr. Ryan, thank you very much. My pleasure. <sighs> and finally tonight, sci-fi <laughs> turning into reality. Star Trek actor William Shatner is headed to space at 90 years old, something to celebrate here. Kristen Fisher is out front. Who's he command? Oh. Using the Enterprise. He led the USS Enterprise on an intergalactic odyssey. Now he will get to go on his own odyssey. Things I've only played as an actor, I'm going to see firsthand. Star Trek's iconic Captain James Kirk will soon get to go to space for real. I'm thrilled. And, and anxious, and a little nervous, and uh, a little uh, 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 frightened about this whole new adventure. Blue Origin announced on Monday that actor William Shatner will be on the company's next flight, alongside Audrey Powers, Blue Origin's Vice President of Mission and Flight Operations. Two, one. Shatner, Powers, and two others will lift off from a remote stretch of West Texas next Tuesday less than three months after the company's first crewed launch. Here, Ken. The crew will enjoy about four minutes of weightlessness during an 11-minute suborbital trip to space, similar to what Jeff Bezos, his brother, and two others did during the summer. On Tuesday morning, I uh, go to the edge of space and, uh, uh, and loosen the restraints around me and be weightless. Uh, and looking into the vastness of uh, the universe. Shatner, who played Captain Kirk on the hit television series Star Trek and went on to star in seven Star Trek films, joked about this opportunity years ago. If you were given the opportunity to go into space, would you? If I got a guarantee that I would come back. That opportunity is now here, and 90-year-old Shatner seems surprised himself. Because 55 years ago, I was destitute, and I'm looking up at the sky, the astronauts uh, uh, stepping on the moon, and, and I have a little bit to do with those astronauts. And 55 years later, I'm going to the into mm. space. I want to come back and, and tell you about how I really felt when I saw these things that we've only learned about secondhand. His fans are excited to hear about his mission, too. 
many taking to Twitter to express their excitement. Late night host Stephen Colbert even making a joke about the mission, tweeting, I hope William Shatner doesn't have unrealistic expectations of what space is like. Kristen Fisher, CNN, Washington. And thanks to Kristen and thanks to you, AC360 starts now. Good evening, Facebook likes to say it was built to bring people together. It literally uses those words in promotional material. Well, today it did bring people together. For the first time in a long time, Democratic and Republican members of the Senate Commerce Subcommittee were together, united in the oh. of whistleblower Frances Haugen. Now, as you know, she's the former Facebook product manager who leaked tens of thousands of pages of internal documents indicating that Facebook knows the harm oh. that they and Instagram can do but chooses to put clicks, eyeballs, and ad sales ahead of fixing the problem. The company's leadership knows how to make Facebook and Instagram safer, but won't make the necessary changes because they have put their astronomical profits before people. The documents I have provided to Congress prove that Facebook has repeatedly misled the public about what its own research reveals about the safety of children, the efficacy of its artificial intelligence systems, and its role in spreading divisive and extreme messages. Well, as you imagine, this is not the company's public position. Listen to what CEO Mark Zuckerberg told lawmakers just last month. The research that we've seen is that using social apps to, to connect with other people can have positive mental health benefits and well-being benefits, like helping people feel more connected and, and less lonely. Mark Zuckerberg talking about the research that he's seen. Now, Francis Haugen on research, we do not know whether he's actually seen, but he was certainly privy to because it was done by the company itself, his company. Facebook's own research about Instagram contains quotes from kids saying, I feel bad when I use Instagram, but I also feel like I can't stop. Right? I, I know that the more time I spend on this, the worse I feel, but like I just can't, like that they want the next click, they want the next like. And in general, so Instagram and Facebook, because that increases engagement, which in turn helps advertising revenue. That much is a simple fact about the way that social networks operate. The fundamental question is, does Facebook build their algorithm knowing it harms your users? And this is how it says the answer is very simply yes. Has Facebook ever offered features that it knew had a negative effect on children's and teens' mental health? Facebook knows that its amplification algorithms, things like engagement-based ranking on Instagram, can lead children from very innocuous topics like healthy recipes, I think all of us can eat a little more healthy, oh. all the way from just something innocent like healthy recipes to anorexia promoting content over a very short period of time. Today's hearing focused heavily on Facebook and Instagram's impact on kids. It also dealt with Facebook's role in amplifying election laws, political violence, and everything else around in the 2020 election and attack on the Capitol. Now, before we play you some of that testimony, though, here's what Facebook's vice president for content policy said, <sighs> policy said on CNN earlier today. Facebook's mm -hmm. responsibility for January 6th lies with those who broke the law and those in politics and elsewhere who excited them. And the work that we did both before the election and all the way through oh, January, oh. with academics and researchers uh, working closely with law enforcement and electoral authorities to understand what the risks were and to put safety measures in place that, that started before the election, well before the election, and continued through March. That was a uh, work that I'm very proud to have been a part of. Uh. I've frankly never seen um, you know, such an effort to prepare for an election. Now, those safety measures were aimed at limiting the spread of falsehoods, misinformation, and incitement. And as you heard Ms. Uh, Haugen say on the program last night, they did not work very well. In any case, the safeguards were lifted immediately after the election. The restrictions on the so-called Stop the Steal movement weren't imposed until after the Capitol attack. Now, today, Ms. Haugen had this to say about why, in her judgment, the company did not maintain those safeguards long. The choices that were happening on the platform were really about how reactive and twitchy was the platform, right? Like how viral was the platform? And Facebook changed those safety defaults in the run-up to the election because they knew they were dangerous. And because they wanted that growth back, they wanted the acceleration of the platform back after the election, they, re they returned to their original defaults. And the fact that they had to, oh, to break the, the glass on January 6th and turn them back on 
And I think that's deeply problematic. So to the lawmakers questioning Ms. Haugen, the company in recent days has pointed to a research project it set up with an outside mm. panel of experts to study the platform's effect on the election. Or the company's own press release on it openly suggests it doesn't consider itself bound by any recommendations that should come from it. And as for how the company treats its own internal research, just last week it published two of the internal studies which were cited today on the harmful mental health impact Instagram has on teen girls. Notably, though, it came with Facebook's own added annotations rebutting or reframing some of the negative points. Not the picture of a company ready or willing to take a hard look at itself that is not in public. For inside corporate walls, well, Princess Haugen spoke to that as well today. I think in general, I'd like you to just confirm for me, uh, this research and the documents containing that research it's not only findings and conclusions, it's also a recommendation for changes. <sighs> what I hear you saying is that again and again and again, these recommendations were just rejected or disregarded, correct? Um, there is a pattern of behavior that I saw on <sighs> Facebook, of Facebook choosing to prioritize its profits over people. And any time that Facebook faced even tiny hits to growth, like 0.1% of sessions, 1% of, of views, that it shows its profits over safety. Joining us now is Yael Eisenstadt, former elections integrity head at Facebook, former CIA officer and former White House advisor. Also, Jennifer Greigel, associate professor of communications at Syracuse University, who studies the harmful effects of social media on teens. Yael, I, you've been speaking out about what you said are the dangers of Facebook since you left the company. How big of a watershed moment do you think was today, given the focus is now on the company's own documents? Um, well, thanks for having me on, Anderson. I, I think it is a oh. watershed moment, but only if we actually do something with the information. You know, everything that's in the documents, especially the documents that were turned over to the SEC, which um, have now been released, I think, only today publicly, oh. they just demonstrate the internal knowledge of what Facebook does and doesn't know about exactly what's happening on their platform. And it confirms what a lot of researchers, activists, former employees such as myself have been saying for years. And so again, it's up to lawmakers now. It's not about whether Facebook is good or bad or does more good than bad. It's about whether or not there are some practices that have harmed democracy, harmed individuals, and potentially broken the law and what the leadership knew about it. This should absolutely be a huge watershed moment and should really make the public understand that at this point, we can no longer just rely on Facebook's own self-selected data points and their own talking points when they like to say have and haven't done. Jennifer, I mean, a lot of people made the analogy to big tobacco purposely misleading the public about the dangers of smoking and when that was revealed, do you think this is as bad as that? It's very different. Um, over time, you know, it may take several years for cancer to manifest, but what we're seeing on Instagram is an imminent threat to teenagers. I am seeing self-harm, and that sounds so abstract. And, you know, senators are talking about it, but what does that look like? I'm talking about starvation. That's uh, how bad the anorexia photos were up there. I'm talking about uh, teenagers cutting themselves. Uh, this context needs to be out there so that parents understand what this looks like. And it's not simply just like smoking a cigarette. Sure, the regulation down the road, you know, maybe we have to manage it that way, but I think we need that context right now. Yeah, you know, as a former CIA officer, you said in the interview that Facebook knows you better than the CIA ever will, which is, I mean, it's a fascinating thing, a fascinating quote. Um, you said Facebook knows more about you than you know about yourself. That is the remarkable thing, and, and you know, you've all know Harari has written about this in, in his book, Homo Deus, that you know, we forget about ourselves. We forget, I mean, I, my mind is like a sieve. I forget things I did you know, 10 years ago or last week. Facebook remembers, and it's all there. They know more. They know about everybody who is a customer of theirs. Yeah, I mean, of course, it was a little bit tongue in cheek, but it really is actually true. And, and this is what I think people need to really understand. 
It's oh, no. not about, again, it's not about Facebook purposely or intentionally saying we want to go harm teenage girls yeah. or we want to radicalize people. I mean, the most shocking revelation to me was the whole idea of how algorithms were recommending extremist groups, which is the core of what I used to work on and what I talked about. But how do they do that? They do that because they hoover up all of your data around the internet, not just when you're using Facebook. Mm -hmm. And they segment you into these profiles to sell you, basically they're not selling your data, but they're selling a profile of you through targeting tools to advertisers. And in order to do that, they have to keep hoovering up our data. And so then they start to infer not just exactly who you are, what photo you posted today, but what's going to really kind of play to your vulnerabilities. And what, what message is gonna keep you coming back for more? And that's why I say they know more about you than you do yourself. Because I might go on to Instagram or, or it's not just Facebook, let's be clear, on to YouTube or, or any of these companies looking for something. And they have inferred that if I am looking for certain political content, that the next thing that I might be interested in is actually the slightly more extreme content. And their own research shows, which is in one of the SEC filings, that people who go on to look for political content, especially conservative political content, humor, not necessarily anything nefarious, within two days are being recommended conspiracy theories and within other week being recommended QAnon content. So that's what I mean by they know more about you than you do yourself or than you think they do. They are yeah. pushing ideas at you. Well, Jennifer, I mean, that's one of the things when you look at QAnon, you know, there have been a lot of, you know, interviews with people who were online interested in moms looking for yoga classes or interested in yoga or, you know, caring about kids, obviously, and wanting to protect children. And then very, through algorithms, were ultimately led into, you know, QAnon ideas, uh, which uh, kind of targeted that. So it's pretty easy for these groups to get radicalized and established quickly on Facebook, like QAnon is more political in nature. But I wanna bring back us uh, back to Instagram because it's different, it's a different platform culturally. And when the teens are brought together there, it feels a little bit more like a cult, okay? You have to communicate through symbols and the way that the recommendations are picking out their friends. You know, again, you could be uh, brought into essentially depressive communities when you weren't depressed before. And so again, I want to raise this, uh, the attention of parents because again, there's something different about Instagram and I think we need to talk about that more. You know, uh, well, Jennifer, to your point, I mean, I, I'm on Instagram and I enjoy it. I look at, you know, I follow friends and look at art sites <sighs> and things like that. But I gotta say, it depresses me. I mean, I leave feeling worse than when I got on not only because I've just wasted eternal amounts of time just you know scrolling through the, the, the images I follow, but I, I feel worse about my own life. I cannot imagine what a teenager feels, I mean, I'm supposedly an adult, what if some kid feels yeah. looking at other people's lives and how their lives seem much more exciting and than their own. We need to humanize this experience more and talk about more of what the teens are experiencing too. We've seen a lot of data and numbers <sighs> high, but like, let me tell you, what they're seeing is just absolutely horrific. <sighs> They're imitating each other and these behaviors because they want belonging on there. They want to connect. And they're not just experiencing friendship in real life. Uh, like we would have known more kids, you know. <laughs> they are living a high <laughs> <world> life <laughs> in the digital world, too. And maybe they were happy one day, and then they get recommended into this downward spiral. 